Uh, the next talk is entitled Co-Speech Gestures and Synthesis and Generative Motion Controllers. The talk will be given by uh, Professor Li Bin Liu from Peking University. Um, actually, I have known Li Bin for many years and he got his PhD degree from Tsinghua University. And now he's a, a assistant professor at Peking University. And his research have, uh, have been recognized by multiple awards Particularly, I want to mention here is uh, one of his most recent, wor recent work won the first SIGGRAPH Asia Best Paper Award. And he will also introduce this work today in the talk. Uh, okay, so let's welcome Li Bin for his talk. And I will okay. stop sharing. Yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see the yeah. slide playing? Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, thanks Bin for the very warm introduction <laughs> and uh, hello everyone. <laughs> so um, in this talk, uh, I will discuss uh, two of our recent works, like both uh, learning gener generative models to create eight uh, realistic uh, human motions. Um, one of the work is like using uh, speech signals to drive the character to perform code speech gestures. And another work is using physics-based simulation uh, that help us help the character to achieve uh, more realistic interaction uh, with the environment and with uh, with uh, un uh, unpredict uh, unpredicted uh, perturbations. So both of the two works were uh, were both uh, published in Sigma Fisher 2022. Um, yeah, in this in my talk there were a lot of uh, uh, videos mm -hmm. and animations. Uh, I'm not sure if my bandwidth, uh, if my internet bandwidth, is good enough for for those videos to play. So if you find if you find if you if you're interested, so feel free to to uh, no, just to, uh, visit my uh, website and there's a list of these videos if you want to want to look. So um, I think the motivation was uh, uh, no, I think Taku has has uh, has has gave a very nice uh, review of the previous works and animation. So here I just uh, briefly. Re review it. So the motivation is still is actually from uh, the uh, the digital the digital character the digital humans. We have seen a very good progress in the past few years. Then uh, there's a, a lot of companies has uh, published their works to create a very realistic human motions. So um, I think the the human motion the digital human has the techniques behind the digital human can be categorized into three different categories. The one is the appearance and which is uh, you know, thanks to the uh, progress of random technique, the graphic technique, we can now achieve very realistic appearance for these digital humans. And then for the language, for the interaction with the character, now we know ChatGPT, right? It's very popular in, 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 now, in recent days. So it can, I, I also know that there are some, uh, some game, uh, game designers who are trying to integrate ChatGPT into their design so that they make their uh, NPC or their 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 avatars to be more interactive to to the to the users. So I think the language development is also dramatic, very fast in, the, in in recently. And the last is the behavior. I mean, it's related to the motion. Uh, this one you now because I was doing I'm doing current animation. So from my point of view, I think the uh, the behavior, the study, the techniques to create the behaviors for digital characters is still. Far be, uh, still fall behind the uh, the progress of other domains. So we can see, like uh, for many companies, they have published their uh, digital human uh, products, uh, but to achieve realistic uh, digital human motion uh, animation. So there are still there often requires a person uh, behind the digital digital character, like who performed the motion to dance. And then the, the motion was captured using some motion capture devices and then transferred to the digital uh, to the character. So there was always a goal that for, for current animation, uh, especially for, for the uh, research in current animation, then to, can, we can we train a model like ChatGPT, right? Then using a lot of motion data and then using a model to create. The, the realistic motions. So we do not need a person behind the character to, to perform those motions. And we hope these models can, can, can take some control signals as input and generate these motions that fit 
the requirements of land control signals. So this this uh, this a uh, uh, long research has been uh, studied you know, in the past decades, and until very recently, maybe uh, five to four, uh, six years ago, uh, no, I think that the first work was done um, by Taku, uh, yeah, the, the PFN. Then and then it's the first uh, paper, the first uh, uh, technique I know that can generate appealing results by only training on a, on a, on a set of, uh, of train, uh, data. Um, but in more recent years, we have seen the applications of generative models, various generative models, you know, from VAE to normaling flows to GANs. And more recently, we have seen a method using different models. So the, type, the, the control signals, you know, the early works all use uh, uh, game, play, uh, game controllers to provide like a direction of the character and the control signals. And now there's more works trying to use higher level uh, descriptions like we can this we can type uh, 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 some uh, descriptions using natural language a uh, natural language and then the model can convert that into a, a short piece of motion so I, I can imagine that this this uh, this uh, uh, line of research can go very fast and maybe in the next few years we can see like we can just import a script and then the character automatically plays performs and scripts and and it becomes a movie. So I believe that it will happen very soon. But here that the this talk, we, we just uh, the first work we are going to uh, discuss is uh, a specific area in this uh, um, uh, motion, sorry, this motion generation. So the goal is to uh, to you know the input, the driving signal is uh, the audio. You now the scenario is like, for example, when I, when I do when I giving this talk, I'm I'm just uh, speaking. And uh, I will do some gesturing uh, while I speak. So this is uh, this a uh, natural. Um, so the people often do this, uh, uh, no, intentionally or not or unintentionally. Just like uh, they trying to convey more information using gestures. So the goal is like how can we create, recreate such gestures based on the audio input. Uh, so this is the problem, and uh, and uh, and we have created pretty good results. So this so this work was uh, published as a paper. Uh, um, the title is is long. I just don't read. Uh, so so if you uh, if you're interested, feel free to to take a look at the paper. Uh, and uh, we are very lucky this year. This paper was uh, selected as one of the four uh, technical uh, best technical papers. And uh, so it's so it's quite exciting for us. And uh, I think it's a very good direction to 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 go. And actually, we know this gesture is a very important part of speaking. So we, we, when we're doing gestures, we add emphasis and clarity to the speech. So gesturing, the automatic generation of gestures has very important roles in many applications, like, like games, like digital humans. And also, there are some very interesting related errors, just like uh, you know, there's online shopping services that use virtual avatars to help them to, to sell goods. So this you know, this this automatic way to generate motions is also helpful for for them. So the the problem, the formal definition of the problem is like uh, we want to train and create a uh, gesture synthesis system that can take several modalities of uh, of uh, of a uh, out of a speech, like including audio. That is uh, definitely the, the most important, and also possibly the text uh, transcripts of the audio. No, actually, this is not a very hard task in in in, in nowadays because the audio, the speech to text technique, has become pretty mature. Now, even for now, I, I know some people are watching the, this talk on Bilibili. Uh, there's a, some there's a realistic translation. Uh, they can they can translate my talk into uh, into text. So this this is actually not a very hard task. And also sometimes we can take a special uh, style uh, indicator, uh, just like the, to specify which people who is talking, you know, because different people may have different styles. So we take all this information as input and try to create a gesture animation that seems uh, natural, naturally accompanies that uh, than a speech. So uh, this is actually a, a very long uh, term 
study, like uh, the the you no know, the earliest the earliest study can be dated back to you know, no three uh, thirty years ago. So basically, I think uh, the, the history of gesture generation is is almost the same as the history of uh, current animation because basically, you know, people are just trying to use the technique to for 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 these specific tasks. So the earlier days, you no, know, where people's people using uh, uh were using. Uh, state machines with uh, combined with uh, with uh, handcrafted rules, and then later we we start to replace the rules with uh, probabilistic models or, or statistics models, and then in the you know with the with the development of deep learning, you know there's a work to start using uh, deep network to learn a end to end generator and directly map uh, audio input to the motion, but there's always a problem from the from the previous. Uh, motion generation method. Now, the the first uh, disadvantage is is the quality. Like the you now we find that the end to end training always generates some uh, averaged motion when we, when it applies to a uh, uh, audio that was not seen in the in the training. So this problem you now is definitely very very uh, challenging. Uh, but there is some we can we can do some analysis on the problem and from and we think there's two. From the two aspect is very important. The first is the rhythm. So, like uh, when we, if we see a people, a person who is talking while dressing, like a uh, like a uh, like Obama, you no, know, there's a we can see like there's a quite uh, consistent uh, cross, uh, there correspondence between the, the rhythm of the motion and the rhythm of the speech. So that makes this problem very similar to uh, music to dance generation tasks. But different from music to dance. So for music, we know that it has a very clear rhythm structure that to, can be easily identified and to use that to, to constrain, uh, to, to help the generation of the dance. But for gesture, we know that the, the rhythm is not stable. Now, even when I'm talking, the stress uh, of my voice no, it, it's it's not it's not a consistent uh, pace. It's just a changing uh, all, all the time. So it's very complicated to 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 make this. This becomes a hard task to make this motion, uh, the rhythm motion to be consistent to the rhythm the the, the audio. Actually, there is a one uh, preliminary uh, results uh, experiment we have done before, where we try to let the character do some random motions. But we manually align the motion, the stress of the motion to the to the to the stresses of the the audio. So even that is random motion, we feel that the motion accompanies the the speech pretty well. But the only the, the only problem is that it do not have semantic meanings. So that also suggests that to make the uh, rhythm matching uh, match to the audio is a very important part of naturalness for gestures. And another problem is uh, is the is the semantic correspondence. So, like uh, uh, for gestures, I mean, it's different from sign language. For gestures, we know this the the correlation between the gesture motion and the audio is very weak. For example, uh, different people or even the single person, the same person, they can use different gestures for the same words. And also, uh, this is and also when they perform the gestures. The time when it's performed that gesture and the word they wanted the gesture to accompany, accompany is not a perfectly temporally aligned. So this actually uh, uh, makes the problems a many-to-many -many mapping problems. So then also make an, uh, a naive end-to-end uh, -end learning algorithm uh, hard to learn the the, the 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 mapping between the two modalities. So, um, so in this work, we were trying to uh, overcome these uh, two problems in uh, by explicitly disentangle uh, the semantic information and the the ryth uh, rhythmic information uh, of both the speech and the gestures. Now, after this entanglement, we then try to build. A con we believe that the relations between the two modalities, the two uh, modes. Are uh, are easier to 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 learn, and then we just we can we can use some learning techniques to to build such relations. Uh, so for the rhythm, the idea is very simple. Uh, so we can we can talk the very in 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 a single slide. 
So we know that the 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 input gesture, the input audio, you no, know, it has a has a has a changing uh, pace. So we can use we can we can use some simple idea, some simple techniques. To, for example, we can use we can identify the onset of the audio input and use that and the indicator of the beat. And based on that, we can uh, normalize the, the duration of each of these segmentation. We segment the, the audio based on the onsets and then de uh, normalize them into the same length. And after that, we can convert each of the normalized audio sequence into the normalized motion. So for the, at this point, we think that at least the motion and the audio are temporarily aligned. So it's easier to, it's make the, 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 the generation e easier problems. And after generating these uh, motion blocks, we then we can, we can apply a denoise process to make uh, the motion back to the same uh, rhythm of the, of the audio. Of course, we, and this, this can introduce some artifacts. So we will apply a Gaussian filter afterwards to make the motion smooth. So this is the this is the, the how we uh, build the connections between the rhythm part of the two mo uh, of the two modes. Sorry, and the phrasmatic part that is more complicated. That is, I think, it's more it's the most interesting part of this paper. So we actually uh, take a look at some uh, uh, linguistic theory, and uh, in the linguistic theory, they actually study a lot um, about the how people, how per human perform their um, gestures. So they have some uh, conclusions. Uh, why, one of them is like the gesture motion. It consists of a sequence of gesture uh, phrases, uh, phases. Now this gesture phases aligns, aligns with the intonational units of the audio. So this gesture phase is often referred as a gesture lexeme. Actually, we, here we actually uh, abuse the, the, the word, the gesture lexeme. We, we, we use the gesture lexeme to refer to a small cluster of gestures that are similar to each other. So like, uh, for example, here, we know we, we each of these uh, uh, colored cluster is referred to the gesture lexeme, and that will be uh, corresponds to the, to, the, to the segment, to the international segment of the, of the audio. And then within each of these cluster, we can see there's a small variations between the motions. And we, we, we assume that each of these motion, this, this, this motion variations is controlled by a latent variables. And then we call it and the gesture style codes. So this is the, how we formulate, the, how we uh, uh, model the gesture motion. And then we still, we have some further relationship between the gesture motion and uh, the audio. So we assume, and this is not only we assume, they actually have some linguistic theory background. So they say that like, the gesture lexeme usually related to the high level semantic audio. So it generally uh, it corresponds to the semantic of the audios. And also the, the gesture style codes, I mean, the variance within each gesture lexeme uh, is, uh, becomes, uh, is uh, related to the low level acoustic audio features, just like uh, the stress, uh, for example, and the, the the, the, the pitch, something like that. So based on this assumption, uh, the, the system, the semantic part is done by like, first we, we have a number of motion, adjusted motion examples. We then, we first uh, uh, construct a gesture lex lexicon, uh, basically a gesture vocabulary by clustering them uh, into a, a, a number of gesture lexemes. And then we, we then disentangle the audio into high-level somatic features and the low-level acoustic features. And then we can build the connections. We can build the mappings between the high-level uh, somatic fe uh, audio features to the gesture lexeme and the low-level audio features to the gesture style codes. Now basically, and this, this then defines the motion variation and then convert those uh, uh, descriptions, motion descriptions into the actual motion. So this is the, fun, the, the, system, the overall system. The first problem is how we can create the uh, the gesture lexicon, uh, the gesture lexicon. So instead of uh, applying uh, clustering and the the, the KN uh, clustering algorithm, this kind of uh, basic techniques, we actually employed a very uh, powerful 
network structure, which is called a vector quantized uh, VAE. Uh, it's a VQ VAE. So it's different from the, the traditional VAE. You know, for traditional VAE, uh, we have an encoder that encodes the motion into a latent variable and then decode that variable into the motion again. For the VQ VAE, we replace the decoding process by first finding the nearest uh, so we first construct. We first have a have have a code book, you know, which contains a number of vectors, latent vectors. And then after we encode the motion into latent space, we find the nearest uh, code from that code book that is nearest to the to the to the latent representation of the motion. And then the decoder will decode that code into the motion. So this this way we actually automatically. Uh, so they, 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 this VQV setting first uh, quantized the the uh, the latent space. Now, the latent space is, was a uh, continuous space, and now we quantize them into a discrete set of uh, of codes, uh, latent codes. And and we find that this each each latent code uh, naturally corresponds to a cluster of motions, where each cluster the motion in each cluster are are, quite, uh, are similar. Uh, with small variations, so like uh, this can be it's become the after training this VQVE, the code book uh, uh, is just becomes the the lecture uh, the gesture lexicon of the of this work. So after that, now the next problem is how we can disentangle the audio features, the high level audio features from low, low audio features. So achieve this using a, uh, uh, a contrastive learning. Uh, so basically, we use we train a auto deep uh, audio encoder. Uh, so basically, it has many layer, many, many convolutional layers. But uh, to to disentangle the high level, we consider the uh, the features at the end of this encoder is high level features, and all the intermediate. Uh, Features of the out out of the intermediate layers and the low level features, so the contrastive learning is done by, like a first. You no, know, we we also have here we also has a text input which can be considered as an anchor of the semantics uh semantic representations. So we're trying to make the high level features as close as possible to this anchor to the to the semantic features extracted from text. And in the in the meantime, we're trying to make the low level features as far as possible from that uh, that anchor features. So this actually make can encourage the high level feature contains the, the the semantic features, and the low level feature only contains tries to only capture the the semantic non semantic features from the audio. So actually, after done this, we find some very interesting uh, results. So this is our uh, motion latent space. We calculate, we categorize, uh, we cluster right, uh, cluster the motion into this space using VKVE. and then we can, after we train this audio encoder, we can cluster the high level audio features using uh, nearest neighbor uh, using KNN, and then we find that for each of these uh, audio clusters. It corresponds to a set of uh, semantically similar words, and also we find that each of this uh, of this uh, semantic similar cluster, it will correspond to a small number of motion clusters. In the meanwhile, if we do the same for the low level audio features, we find that the, the each of the low level audio feature cluster will correspond to a lot of Almost the every uh, motions. So it, it also suggests that the high level feature, after we do this clustering, this high level and the low level audio feature disentanglement, the high level features defines the gesture, what the gesture cluster it will use, it should use. And the low level feature, presumably, it defines the variations within each clusters. Then it's basically the, the the uh, the idea and the results we have seen in the preliminary results. So here are some results for some examples for the high level feature clusters. So there are so many people. War monkeys are here. So you can see these few words are semantically similar. They are using similar. They're using this few 
clusters. And for the other semantic similar words, they will be they will correspond to, to a different set of uh, of just uh, motion motion clusters. No water, no food. Never give up. Okay, and then after this, we have built, uh, we have decoupled the high-level features uh, of audios and uh, the the high, the just relaxing and just style codes, and then we just simply learn a neural network to map a uh, given input mode uh, audios to the to the uh, to, to, sorry map the given input a uh, high-level audio features to the high-level to the lexic uh, just relaxing and low-level hot feature to the gesture style codes. And to, to, to get a better results, we have uh, we, we test our method on seven uh, on three different uh, data sets. And uh, to get a better a good result, we actually collect a Chinese uh, gesture data set for, uh, by ourselves. And uh, here is a very here is an example where we use uh, 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 Obama's uh, speech we found on YouTube and generate motion. This video, this audio was now seen in the in the training data. I am here with students at Wakefield High School in Arlington, Virginia. And we've got students tuning in from all across America, from kindergarten through 12th grade. And I am just so glad that all could join us today. And I want to thank Wakefield for being such an outstanding host. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Yeah, you can see that the, the rhythm and the semantic matches the, the, the input audio pretty well. And also, and also, although we train these uh, models on English and the Chinese data set, it can automatically transfer to other language. Like uh, we can do automatically, we can use a French input. I'm sorry. De manière culturelle, artistique, sociale, mais aussi émotionnelle. Aujourd'hui, on se demande encore comment est-ce que tant de gens sont venus. Et sont revenus. And also, the system can be extended. Like we can add an extra codes now in addition to the style codes to control some high level, uh, some detailed um, uh, motion features. For example, we can use them to control the height of the character when it uh, it performs a, a, a gesture. So here is a very simple example. Straight and kind of so this is a uh, we let the character use a lower right hand. And this one, I, we let the character to, to have a higher right hand, so you can see the difference. And there's this fantastic thing where like, um, like my dad made some sort of like inappropriate joke uh, or something like that. And I like, I How, like just straight. Okay, so, uh, so as a conclusion, uh, so this work, we, uh, we present a sorry, rhythmic and uh, semantic aware because we gesture synthesis system. So we actually dis explicitly disentangle the rhythm part and the semantic part, and also it, it disentangle the high-level features of audio and, and the low-level feature of audios and uh, the, the, correspond the corresponding features of the, of the motions. By explicitly build a connection between these uh, correspondences, we can create a very nice uh, audio output. Um, so, sorry. So the motion generation, uh, the, the method we discussed about, uh, before is, uh, is mostly uh, called the kinematic method. So they generate motions without considering the physics of the, of the world. So that actually they, uh, it can cause some artifacts such as foot skating and uh, penetration with the environment. And also for the more, um, for interaction with the environment, so for example, like this, uh, this few examples, uh, the kinematic method is has will there's a, sorry it becomes very difficult for the kinematic problem uh, kinematic method to generate this kind of unseen motions you now because for kinematic motion method we usually need the data be captured and, and then we can generate the motion based on the on the kind of signals for this kind of motions for especially for the unprotect unpredictable perturbations of the, from the environment. It's very hard to capture the motion, example motions. So that makes this uh, kinematic method very hard to, to create a motion for these, for these uh, scenarios. So the solution, we always think the solution is the physics-based animation. So we're trying to uh, replace then to the, the generator uh, generation process 
with a uh, physics simulation. And so we actually were trying to reproduce the ways that real human, uh, real animals create their motion in real world. So the problem here is that we need to create a controller, motion controller that applies, that computes the, 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 the actions, the, the, for example, the muscle forces, the joint talks to activate the character in this simulated environment. But this motion controller is very difficult to, to, to create, to, to design. So that actually makes this physics-based method, you know, we, 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 always, we always promise that the physics-based method is the next generation of animation techniques. But after 20 years from the first work, or 30 years from the first work in any direction, and still no games actually really use this technique. So the difficulty is always the motion controller is very hard to, to create. So now in the in the few past few years, we have seen uh, a very good progress in, in re reinforced learning, especially the deep reinforced learning. Uh, so we know that the, 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 the technique is very, the idea is simple. We just like the character to interact with, with the environment and uh, using the environment's feedback to update this policy to, to compute the, the, their talks or her own muscle forces. So using this method, we actually can achieve very good uh, physics-based controllers by tracking uh, reference motions. So, but there, there's one problem. So we can see there has been very good results, you know, in the past few years, you know, from the basketball to the to the uh, soccer uh, dribbling and to very, very complicated tasks that so they can achieve very, uh, all these all this very nice works. But the top problem of this traditional IR method is that we always need to retrain the policy for each of the tasks. And we and the and every time we change a policy, it takes quite a long time, uh, quite a long time to 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 finish. Now, uh, usually uh, at least a few hours. Uh, for a, for more complex tasks, it can go to to days to 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 finish. So the, there's a a question regarding to this problem. Now we know for the for the motion, we can for the kinematic method, we can train a generative models, then it can automatically create. And then have, can learn a number of motions, and then use the, all this knowledge to create motions based on the on the control signals. The problem is how whether we can convert this the same idea to the physics based animation. That means can we create a generative motion controllers that can you know, do can learn a, a, a large number of mo, uh, motion scales? The answer is uh, yes. Uh, so we have seen a few works in the past uh, five, few years that uh, learns uh, a motion embeddings or motion primitives from a number of uh, motion examples. So after after learning, you know, we can generate we can generate samples from uh, we can sample from that motion primitives and then use and use use policy and simulation to create the, the corresponding motions. But the problem with this pro of this training is, is that. To train a control policy, we needed to let the let the control policy to compute a activa activation of the, for the character. For example, we can compute the John talk, and then we input the John talk into simulation, and then to compute the next days, and then it becomes a reward. And then we need to use the, that reward, you know, in the IO uh, framework. We need to use that reward to to compute the improvement direction for the control policy. But the problem here is that the simulation, the simulation engine is often considered a black box. So which means we cannot directly compute a gradient through this uh, simulation uh, simulator. So the previous work I already used some, you know, some, some techniques to, uh, to sidestep uh, this, this problem. For example, we can, we can use a number of motions uh, we can use behavior clonings, which completely get rid of simulation, or we can use like model frame learning. Then you, you know, to basically the the, 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 the typical I/O settings. You know, it's a model model based uh, model free method. So the problem is of this work is like uh, the if you if we for the behavior cloning, if it directly if it get rid of the simulation, we cannot guarantee the learned motion is physically correct. Then it will degenerate the motion quality. And also for the model frame method, we know it will it needs a, a quite large number of, of, of samples to to compute the expectation of the simulation. So that's also a waste of uh, of simulation. And also 
because I or reinforced learning is not a very stable process. And uh, for model free method, for example, the MP and the SE, uh, they are using the GAN, uh, the Gale, you know, basically adversary training. So that is also a, another unstable training process. So these two training processes combined can make this problem uh, a bit hard to tune. I mean, if you can, if it works, then it works. If it don't work, it, will, it, it, it becomes a problem. So the the uh, the our solution. So we thought we, we take a look at the human. Like when we for human for human to learn motion, they don't have really have a very accurate uh, a sense of the physics of the world. Instead, it has a very rough approximation of the world. So they can use this approximation to predict what's the, what's the results of action. And use that based on that, it can keep continue, uh, improving its scale you know, based on this, uh, this imagination using the world model. So the, our, the second work of this, this talk, well, well, I'll go this very fast, is that we, we use model-based learning, uh, the idea of model-based model learning to help us to create a generative model. And we use the VAE and this generative model. And this work is also published in SIGGRAPH uh, Asia 2022. So here is a preliminary results. We can see like the, after the learning, the character can interact with the environment. We can throw balls to it, we can push it, and the character, when it interacts with the environment, it automatically changes its uh, motion uh, based on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on its states. So the basic idea is like, uh, no, on real simulation, uh, we, we pose actual, as I, we, the character states advances based on this action and the user simulator uh, and, the, and the simulation will, will advance based on this input and compute the next states. And this will keep going and to, to generate a long sequence you know, based on the, on the user inputs. And then uh, some recent work, you know, especially the super track that was a, a SIGGRAPH uh, 2021 work that tells us that uh, this approximation can be done by simply learning a neural network. So which we call it, we call it a word model. So it works just, just like a simulator. This word model also takes the states and the action as input and, and predicts the next states. So this whole process is, because the word model is neural network, so this whole process is differentiable. So we can generate a, a long sequence using the word model and compare the, this long sequence with the real simulation. And this can help us to train this word model to approximate the, uh, the, the real simulator. So here is a, the, a, one example. Uh, so although we think this the word model, the original, we, we originally thought this word, model, this word model can be inaccurate, but in fact, it's pretty accurate, it's accurate enough to capture the, the real simulation by, uh, pretty well. So based on the word model, we can now try to train these motion embeddings or these generative models using using the diff, uh, with the help of the, this differentiable uh, word model or differential simulator. So the process is very similar to a generative model uh, or or VE. Uh, so we know VE is has an encoder and a, and a decoder. So if we're given it a pose, the, the encoder will first map into an embedding space and then decode them to recover the original motion. And on the runtime, we can re get rid of the encoder and only have the decoder to, to uh, convert a sample from the embedding space to the motion. And this is exactly the, the idea of motion VE, that is kinematic-based method. We, we are, it takes a two uh, example motion, uh, example pose as input, and it computes a embedding, uh, pose embedding, and then use the decoder to reconstruct the motion. If we take this encoder, uh, we can think how we can, we can convert this process into a physics-based method. So we can consider for the, the, the way the kinematic-based method create a next pose is directly use the network to compute the next pose. But for the physics-based method, the, the problem is a bit more complicated. We needed to use the control policy to compute action and use an action to drive the character in the simulator to compute the next states. So when consider this control policy and the simulator as the decoder of motion VAE. And now we also have the word model that have approximated the simulator. 
So we can use this word model during the training to train this control policy. And after that, after training, we can get we can disable this word model and use the simulator and runtime. So the training of this control VE is becomes very similar. Uh, this VE structure is very similar to the control uh, to the motion to the training of a normal VE, where we just uh, use this to, to create an, a, a sequence by uh, keep executing the policy and uh, keep uh, executing the word model, and then let it generate the motion to be uh, to close to be as close as possible to the reference. So here the, the word model is phrased. We only train the control policy. And after training, the control policy already has a, has, a, has a motion embedding. And then we can sample from that uh, embedding space and uh, convert and sample use the user controller into a, into a control signal and then use a real simulator to, to drive the simulation. So here are some results that we can, uh, we can just randomly sample from that embedding space and convert them to a number of motions. But here we can see the motion quality is not very good. The problem is, the, is that if it is directly disabled, so sorry, during the training, during the training, the encoder knows the, the desired states and the current states. It will compute a motion, a computer encoding uh, the latent, latent arrivals. But under, but after training, we, we disable the encoder and directly sample from the latent space. And at that, at that moment, this latent space do not know anything about the input states. So that means there's no feedback to help it to correct any errors accumulated during the simulation. So to help to, to, to mitigate these problems, we actually introduce another network that we call as the, uh, sorry, as the uh, state-dependent state prior. So it's like a different from the original VE, which used N01, uh, the, the standard normal distribution as its latent distribution. We actually make this normal di distribution conditioned on the current states. So this way, we, it helps the, the prior and the control policy knows the current states. So it can help the, the motion, the the, the the controller to create a uh, more consistent and more uh, more natural uh, motion results. So here is our two examples. The first one is learned using the original VE, the standard normal distribution, and the, the curves here is a motion. It's a it's a latent code of a single motion in this latent space. We can say it's quite messy, but if we use that state condition prior, the motion each of the motion is more looks more consistent. And uh, that also leads to a better, uh, 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 a smoother motion. So the whole pipeline is is is, uh, is seen like this. We first uh, collect some samples and use the samples to train the, the word model, and then we use the word model to train the policy. So we actually we interleave these two processes. That means we do not train the word model to the to the to the most accurate. Uh, but we just uh, keep generating new samples using the current policy and use the policy, use the samples to update the word model and use the new word model to update the policy. And it becomes a, a, a loop. So here are some results. So using that uh, training, we can generate a, a state a skill embedding. And then we sample from that skill embedding, we can generate a, 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 a diverse set of actions during simulation. And also the word model because it's accurate, uh, accurately captures the, um, the, the real simulation. So we can actually train a downstream task with the help of the word model. For example, we can, sorry, for example, we can make, we can give it a controller, uh, it a control signal, uh, such as that the one character to move forward and a, and a certain speed, a certain space, a speed. And then we use the word model to generate a, a sequence, and then we measure whether the sequence uh, consists with the, the, the control signal. And we use this information to, to update a high level policy, then, then generating a, uh, then choosing the proper uh, scale in an embedding space. It can help us to finish, to, to finish these downstream tasks. 
So, uh, and then here are some results. So we can use this word model uh, with this model-based learning to train high-level policies to operate in the embedding space to make the character follows the, the control uh, signals. Like we can go different directions. We can, we can do different actions. And also using the word model, we can see like uh, it can achieve a higher performance than the model free method in a shorter time on these downstream tasks. Now, actually, we can we can we can train that to, uh, moving the direction control in half an hour, but to achieve the same level of performance, the, the model free method like PPO, they had they needed you know three hours at least to 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 finish the task. Okay, so here are some more results. We can we can do uh, direction control and hiding control. Uh, we can train high level policies to let the character to run and stop at certain uh, target positions, and also we can make the character to uh, resist to external perturbations, and it generates a, a automatically generates natural uh, response to the perturbation. So uh, to conclusion, uh, to conclude, so we, in this work we have a, a pre presented a model-based method to train a generative models. These generative models can be can combine with the word model to achieve a very efficient training of downstream tasks. Uh, but definitely there are some limitations. You now the currently we, we still have in, encounter some issues when scaling up to a larger data set. You now the training data we use for the demos, you now it contains only fifteen minutes motion. We try to use that for one hour motion, we find that the, 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 the results is not, a, uh, sentence, not as good as we expected. So I think, so we think that it might be related to the identical structure because currently we only use a very simple MLP. Uh, so using a very more complex uh, network may help. And also improving, the, you know, replacing that to VAE to a VQ VAE may be another way to improve the quality. And that exactly the 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 very what's next? You know, we we should we can do. You know, the first day is like a, whether we can train a chat GP level of uh, this kind of motion model. We can call it a digital cere uh, cerebrum. You know, basically, like how the human the animals cerebrum uh, to you know is related to their motion. You no, know, if we if we can do that, we can we can use that to to to, uh, to do very interesting things. Another thing is whether we can combine this with uh, with large language models, such as ChatGPT. So actually, this is very interesting experiments we have done with ChatGPT, where we let ChatGPT we tell it to create a, a action sequence that can make the character move out of the of a rule. So it actually gave a sequence of actions, and then we can think like whether we can convert these sequence of actions into a sequence of motions, and then the automatic becomes a performance. So then that will be a very interesting uh, topics to explore in the future. Okay, that's uh, that's all of my talk. Uh, sorry for <laughs> it's a bit long. Thanks so much, Levin, for your excellent talk. And I think both of the paper a very practical technique for automatic motion generation. Uh, since we are out of time, let me ask a quick question, maybe about the the first talk. Um, like from the, the Obama speech example, I see there are some motions like the, the character pointing to the left first and then pointing to the right, uh, like uh, mm -hmm. after. So, mm -hmm. because people have some symmetric like uh, character uh, properties. So will this um, bring some ambiguity issue when you do the training or not? Um, I think uh, because we we have a we have you know, the, our network struct design. Um, sorry, in the representation of our uh, our motion model, we say that there's actually a style code that captures these kind of variations. Uh, so uh, well, after training, we can yeah definitely this is a problem. But uh, you know, using this the style code, we can make this uh, uh, not that much, but it's mm -hmm. still yeah, but. It, 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 it definitely, but that's true. That might be has these uh, these ambiguity issues. Yeah, but I think for for these demos, I think another issues uh, you no know, is also if you don't if you see these motions for a long time, you may find that this character tries to overact. 
that means it always perform gestures, but in, for a real person, real human, they will not do this all that much. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the limitation of this work. But I think that this work, this might be, we might need another ways to, to predict whether the character need to, per, to do the gesture or not. Okay, so maybe let me ask the last question. So how you evaluate the motion or the gesture is natural or, or not? <laughs> well, I believe this is a very tough question. I mean, if you ask any people who do gen uh -huh. motion generation or, uh -huh. or rendering, they will have the same issue. How, what uh -huh. is the best results? Uh, honestly, no, <laughs> we don't have other <laughs> ways to do this. So actually for, for, for all of our work, we usually rely on human. Uh, um, and we, we, we do your study, we collect, mm -hmm. we, we recruit a number of, uh, of, of uh, people uh, who help us to, to score the, the ultimate motion. But I think the way ChatGPT uh, is trained, maybe mm -hmm. a, a ways to, to help this problem. Like we can possibly recruit a, a hundred, hundreds of people to do the scoring uh, mm -hmm. task and then use that results to train a discriminator to help us. That might be a possible way to do this. Okay, this is a very inspiring like suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, we're out of time and that's all about today's seminar. And let me thank all of our speakers for their excellent talk and also the inspiring discussions. And also, I want to thank all the audience for your watching. And bye-bye. <laughs>